speculation had become crazy. Once you swallow the bounce into this bottle, you have eaten so much stuff. You just turn this one dial. The most powerful nootropic I've ever taken. Only Legere in America Nicola Industries can make this powerful nootropic. Only Legere in America Nicola Industries can make this powerful nootropic. Only Legere in America Nicola Industries is like only the share in the future of our nation. Make it until you make it. Now is the time to buy. And then all of a sudden you change the world. Go mortgage your house and buy Bitcoin with it. Doing what you want to do in life is like being on vacation every single day. Welcome back to Griftonomics. The crypto mining space is a very contentious space. Some people will tell you that they're burning as much electricity as a small country, while others will tell you that it's actually pushing forward the revolution of renewable energy. So to help us untangle all of this, today we're joined by Katan Joshi, climate analyst and communications expert. Uh, welcome to the show. Hi, good to be here. Awesome. Thanks for coming on. So just to start, would you mind introducing yourself and your work in the space? Sure. Uh, my name is Katan. Uh, I've been working in climate and energy since uh, 2010. I started off in the renewable energy industry. Uh, I did a lot of data analysis and operations for a bunch of wind farms. Uh, we, we were based in Sydney, but we had wind farms in South Australia, Western Australia and New South Wales uh, mm -hmm. and a few in development in Victoria. Uh, I started off doing like data analysis um, on operational and energy market stuff. Um, which, you know, maybe we can get into it later on if you like yeah. um, what's going on in Australia because, of course, it has a lot of relevance to what we're going to talk about sure. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, you know, I sort of moved into the communications world because I was really interested in all of the politics of what was happening with climate around that time. If you sort of remember the early 2010s was, you know, there was just a lot of turmoil, a lot of prime ministers losing their jobs uh, over climate on both sides. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, renewable energy, of course, was getting this huge amount of focus because, of course, uh, a lot of people were blaming it for stuff. A lot of people were sort of like, I guess, maybe over-celebrating it to some degree. Uh, and it was really interesting to see it all play out. Um, and then after that, I worked at a government agency uh, for about a year doing a really similar thing, like, mm -hmm. like sort of analysis mixed with comms. Okay. Um, and then since then, I, I sort of uh, I left Australia in 2019, uh, moved to, to Norway um, for uh, work, family stuff. Um, and I have been uh, I wrote a book about that sort of 10 year experience um, on an Australian climate and energy politics called Windfall, Unlocking a Fossil Free Future. Nice. Uh, and since then, I've kind of been doing um, a lot more sort of uh, like maybe investigative, like journalistic style stuff. So I did a lot of writing um for a bunch of outlets um, and most recently I've been advising an NGO on corporate net zero targets and greenwashing uh, mm. which is kind of what I've been doing for the past like maybe sort of nearly a year now um, and it uh, has really tuned my mind to when uh, companies are making stuff up um, and Absolutely. particularly when uh, very sort of like high emitting or fossil exposed companies are making stuff up uh, and so uh, yeah about a year ago um, uh, I started doing that. It's been really good. Okay. Well, yes, I definitely want to dig into some of that. So um, just to begin with, um, you know, I think a lot of people know about crypto. They know that, you know, proof of work based cryptocurrencies burn a lot of electricity. I think there's been a lot of news coverage, but could you give just kind of a two second overview of, of how it's burning electricity and how much electricity these cryptocurrencies are actually burning kind of relative, you know, to, to the rest of the emitters in the world? Yeah, it's, it's actually a really vexed question because uh, fundamentally the way that you would calculate this with any other industry uh, is you would kind of just ask the companies, right? Um, you can do this calculation for, a, you know, the world's aluminium smelting companies um, mm. because they tend to be, have no real problem, you know, um, disclosing what their energy consumption was for the year. It's just like a standard part of corporate reporting, um, particularly like sustainability and climate reporting, you know, we consumed 20 tera, you know, uh, 20 gigawatt hours over the, sp the space of this particular period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, for Bitcoin mining, you just don't have that data. Um, Bitcoin wow. mining companies really just uh, hate, hate, hate disclosing that sort of stuff. Uh, and so what, the estimates that are out there are these sorts of uh, calculations uh, that use a bunch of variables like um, Bitcoin price at the moment, um, hash rate, things like that, mm -hmm. uh, to come up with a guess of what the power consumption is. Uh, 
Uh, and it's so wild to see because the error bars on these calculations are just monumental, right? Like you've just yeah. never seen anything like it. <laughs> uh, and so I did a blog post about a year ago on this, um, mm-hmm. you know, particularly inspired by what I was doing a lot of reading on greenwashing and um, uh, sort of false climate narratives. Right. Uh, and that was precisely what got, got me into, what drew me into um, reading and writing about Bitcoin mining. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was the first thing I went to check, right? It was like, okay, you know, what's the sense of scale here? Um, and, uh, you know, I did some calculations in this old blog post. So it's, it's, it's from about a year ago. Right. Um, Bitcoin mining power consumption is actually higher now than it was one year ago. I can only imagine, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but I had some comparisons in there. You know, you can um, companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, etc., uh, disclose how much power they consume Correct, throughout yeah. their operations. Uh, and so, Google, for instance, um, consumes about ten terawatt hours to run their data centers. Uh, Microsoft uh, was nine point two in this data set that I found. Apple is one point three. Uh, and Bitcoin mining ranges somewhere between, in this data that I prepared a year ago, uh, it ranged then between somewhere between 70 and 440. <laughs> That's quite the range. So, but it's also multiples <laughs> bigger than any of those yeah. companies. It, exactly right. So, so you know, even the best case scenario, the lowest possible um, end of the range wow. is monumental. Um, so I think a lot of people would have heard comparisons to different countries and things like that, hmm. um, which can be a bit of a somewhat confusing like it gives, certainly gives you a sense of the scale mm-hmm. um but i think it's pretty meaningful to, to try and compare it to the most similar type of industries mm-hmm. and so the international energy agency for instance came up with a guess of how much all data centers um around the world are consuming um and it you know it was sort of at the, at the time that i looked it was roughly around what bitcoin mining um, wow. uh, was consuming as well right so that's crazy you know yeah, and so, um, you know, maybe we'll get into it a bit later, but um, you, a lot of the defenses around this are sort of a, a plea around why are you policing our consumption? You know, uh-huh. what, like how come you're not yelling at gamers or how come you're not um, right. getting mad about Christmas lights? Uh, and the simple fact is is that none of those activities consume energy on a scale quite like this relative to what it returns to society, which is, you know, not a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. So one of the things I really want to focus this discussion on, because I feel like a lot of people have talked about, uh, you know, Bitcoin's, the Bitcoin energy crisis and how much it's uh, electricity it's burning. But there's some pretty common rebuttals that you receive when you talk about this stuff or even try to mention it. Um, And so I want to kind of center around those. The first of those being a lot of people say that Bitcoin or cryptocurrency only consumes a small percentage of the world's electricity. So like, what's all the fuss about? it's that's such a strange (laughs) that's such a strange argument um because uh like we don't we don't operate on that global scale for anything in in our lives ever right um you know if you if you sort of uh like if you drive your four-wheel drive up to the front of a school and you just leave you just turn the engine on and you just walk away from it and you leave the engine idling for a week outside of school you can't then argue that it was a, a tiny proportion of total energy relative to total global consumption. You know, we, we just never make this. There is no circumstance in which that's a relevant or meaningful thing to say. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, total, like, th- even then, there's a lot of tricky things that they're doing with that with that number. So, for instance, they won't just talk about electricity consumption. They'll actually talk about total energy. Mm-hmm. So, um, just to explain what the, what the distinction is, Electricity consumption is measured in uh, watt hours, um, mm-hmm. you've, or you, some people probably would have heard like you know it, something's outputting a certain number of watts. Um, but energy actually refers to stuff that isn't electricity. So when you burn a when you burn a lump of coal and you heat up some steam and you use it to you know uh, do something, or if you if you um, burn some gas and you use it to like uh, do something to a lump of steel. That's also energy, um, and you can measure it. And it's and it's basically lumping all the electricity. Uh, all the industrial energy, uh, a whole bunch of other things like, um, you know, the jet engine on a plane. Um, mm-hmm. It's adding it all together. Um, and you're not actually only comparing electricity to electricity, right? Um, so there's there's basically no mm. way that um, an electrical consumption or generator is going to compete with the energy from a jet engine. 
Right. Um, they're physically isolated things, right? They're completely, completely separate. Uh, so, so this number is referred to as primary energy, right? Um, mm -hmm. And on top of all of that, uh, when you burn a fossil fuel, you actually only end up using about roughly 30 to 40% of uh, the energy that kind of spurts out of it when you burn sure. it, right? So about 60% is lost as waste heat. As waste heat. Um, it's kind of what you would expect, you know? We have such a strange way of acquiring energy. Like we sort of burn something, we then heat up something else, and then that, that makes something else spin, and then that, that spinning creates a current and some <laughs> wires. There's so many steps there. Um, and uh, so fossil fuels are quite a wasteful way of, of, of generating electricity. Um, and uh, so that comparison is is not only strange and illogical to even bring up in the first place, right? But it's also it's also padding it out with a bunch of extra things that make the comparison, um, you know, that tries to minimize the um, scale of, of Bitcoin mining power consumption. I see, I see. Yeah, I think the other kind of thing they tack onto that is they say, well, nobody's criticizing how much energy Visa uses, for instance, right? <laughs> Um, but is that really a fair comparison in terms of the utility that, that the thing is providing? No, of course not. I mean, so this is where uh, my knowledge and experience kind of hit a bit of a wall because I'm not a, I'm not a banking kind of like sure, uh, yeah. finance expert. I'm, a, I'm a, like a sort of power, energy and climate expert. Yeah. Um, but there is a, there's a, there's a um, dude who sort of writes under the name of um, Digiconomist. I think his name is yes, Alex DeBreeze. Yeah. And he's, he's done some really interesting stuff on the, that bit as a comparison. But of course, um, you can kind of read that on his website. It kind of highlights that uh, Visa, of course, is, more, is much more electrically efficient for the service that's provided, which is I've just bought a thing, you know, use for sure. whatever. Uh, but I think the really important thing there is, is actually... Um, uh, I wonder, you can really, if you were to just pick a random person off the street and just go, just prod them and go, okay, tell me what you think of when you, when I talk about Visa. And they'll be like, well, I'll pay this stuff. You know, I've used it 10 times already today. And then you, you sort of prod them again and, okay, okay, what do you think about Bitcoin? Um, and, you know, you're very likely to kind of get like a, you know, like glazed over kind of uh, someone <laughs> like my colleague was yelling at me about it. <laughs> it's got really confused. Um, and... Uh, then you compare the sort of uh, energy footprint of those two systems, right? Um, and it's it's a shocking difference. Yeah. Um, the one that is barely known and so niche and, and, you know, kind of like really culturally constrained and socially constrained to a very small group of people is the thing that is like this golem, you know, like this incredible yeah. beast of, of power consumption. That's crazy. Uh, and it's that funny ratio it's that it's that disconnect um that draws the attention and it draws like the sort of moral uh, uh like challenge of yeah. uh what bitcoin is right because uh and it's it's sort of hard to like you hear these pleas or these excuses of like oh well you know they, they kind of almost feel a bit victimized they're like why are you yelling at me for consuming power sure. how dare you police power consumption and it's <laughs> like well you are very, very unique, uh, and exactly. you stand out extremely, like a lot. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and so as somebody, you're just going to get that attention. As somebody that does have experience in the space, like I can tell you that you know, Bitcoin for all that electricity it burns is doing maybe seven transactions per second. Is it as it where it yeah. caps out? And Visa <laughs> is operating in the thousands. And so, I think you know, there's just the scale there is is a silly comparison. So, bring it back in. Um, the other common comeback I hear whenever you say, well, Bitcoin's destroying the environment um, is how it's actually supposedly leveraging excess power from the grid that would otherwise go to waste. So they're actually doing us a favor by using this electricity that would otherwise be wasted. One, is that real? And if so, like, how does it work? And it's yeah. still not good for the environment, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. okay, so... <laughs> This is a really frustrating one because it's it, it actually it's one of those arguments that sounds pretty convincing when you when you mm -hmm. sort of hear it. Uh, mm -hmm. it it's quite a it, in, intuitive argument, um, mm -hmm. and people hear it and they're like, "Yeah, actually, that's you know, if there's if no one's using it, why not just utilize yeah. that power for something?" And so, but of course, you know, <laughs> you can tell what I'm going to say. It's wrong, but wrong at every single possible level that it can be wrong at. Uh, so. <laughs> So first of all, does excess 
power exists, right? Like, is there is there sort of like wasted, spilled, or, or unused uh, energy, electrical power, potential electrical power that's kind of just daily being wasted? Mm-hmm. Um, and the example that gets brought up is uh, in China, a whole bunch of very large hydropower plants were constructed in a very geographically uh, constrained set of locations that were gotcha. not necessarily connected to electrical demand centers, right? So, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's basically, if you can imagine it, uh, it's it's a relatively simple physical thing, which is just a huge, huge mass of water that you could potentially make run through the turbines sure. and generate a huge amount of power, but they're not going to do it because there's only so many people that the plant is connected to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if they don't demand the power then you shouldn't really generate it. Well, then you physically can't generate it mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. because the way a grid works is that you have to precisely match power generation and consumption at all times. Sure. Uh, and so this is an example that gets brought up as like, well, great, you know, that's waste. Like why not slap a Bitcoin mine uh, on that hydropower plant um, so that, you know, they can kind of use some of that water uh, to, um, uh, you know, earn some cash uh, and maybe the hydro plant can get some cash too and they can build a new hydro plant. Yeah. Um, and what it does is it ignores the fact that when people talk about hurting the environment or damaging the environment, what they're actually talking about is hurting the process of transition, right? We are, uh, fossil fuels exist in, uh, at an almost unimaginable scale uh, mm-hmm. in China, for instance, right? There's a very large proportion of coal and gas for sure. on their power grid. Uh, and that needs to be reduced very, very significantly. Now, the way that you do that with renewable energy uh, or, or, you know, nuclear or hydro um, or, you know, geothermal, a bunch of other options, is that you build the generation facility, but you also connect it to where demand is using transmission lines. Mm -hmm. This is the really big challenge of basically every single country in the world. I've been a little bit obsessed with Australia, for instance, and the whole challenge of developing a new transmission network over the next, Mm -hmm. you know, sort of half decade. Uh, but America is having really similar, really similar struggles. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, you know, you are not going to be able to decarbonize effectively unless you connect up power generation to demand centers, right? Sure. Um, in Germany is actually a really good, good, bad example of this because uh, what they did was they developed a lot of wind power in the north. There's a lot of people who live in the south. Um, I may uh-huh. have that the wrong way around, but you get the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and... Um, uh, they wanted to, they were like, oh crap, okay, now we've got a lot of renewable energy, not where the people are. And they tried developing a transmission line and the communities opposed it very, very strongly. Uh, and in the end, they had to pay basically quite a huge sum to get these um, power links buried underground so that people would object to them less. Um, but the consequence is that Germany's rollout of renewables, um, particularly wind power, slowed down really, really, really significantly to the extent where had it not been for COVID, they would have absolutely have missed their 2020 climate targets by a, by a substantial huh. margin, right? Um, purely because fossil fuels are lingering in the power system because renewables aren't being built fast I enough. I see, yeah. So if you, have a, if you have a wind farm or a solar farm or a hydro plant or something that's clean uh, and it's kind of like geographically isolated and it's not, you know, being able to generate its full output due to a lack of transmission capacity... If you go and slap a Bitcoin mine next to it, um, that that will fundamentally disincentivize the construction of a new transmission line um, to I connect see. up the power to the demand. Okay. Um, so, so basically, these things aren't existing in like a sort of perfect ideal, right? They're actually existing in a really complicated and dramatic process of change. Uh, and, and when you are experiencing this process of change, everything gets really, really sensitive. Mm-hmm. Uh, decisions become a lot more sensitive to being wrecked. You know, we've had pandemics, we've had a war, um, we've had a bunch of like supply chain disruptions, mm-hmm. um, all impacting the pace of the energy transition around the world at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so something like Bitcoin mining can actually have a really, really negative effect as well, particularly on renewable energy that is framed or presented as stranded, but is really a, a victim of bad planning um, I see. and is, is not being dedicated purely to the task that it must be solely dedicated to, which is getting fossil fuels out of the system. Mm. Um, and so, so this is kind of what, what's get left, what gets left out of that is that if you have some sort of renewable energy that's stranded, um, then something has gone terribly wrong. 
um, exactly. should not be stranded. <laughs> yeah, and then Bitcoin might throw yeah. a spanner in the works of really that problem getting fixed. So that that yeah. that's really good because it segues into my next question, which is, you know, it kind of always running alongside that previous argument about like leftover energy is that well, you know, Bitcoin's actually, you know, because it, it uses so much electricity, is actually going to push forward the development of renewable energy sources because we'll just need so much electricity to mine it. Um, and so it's actually good for the world because renewable energy is going to get all this investment. Is, is that nonsense? Or yeah. yeah, it was funny rereading my my blog post from about a year ago on this. And I'm, and I'm going to be writing a follow-up pretty soon um, because there's cool. been a lot of interesting updates on this. But but fundamentally, um, a point that I made in it is that uh, the construction of renewable energy uh, is not a neutral or energy-less thing to do. Uh, so mm. basically, you need you need raw materials. Uh, you need a bunch of political, economic, and social power mm -hmm. to be used up to some degree, right? So political, you, need, you, you often need um, planning, um, uh, sort of like friendly planning schemes, uh, economic, you need you need cash to build it. Um, renewable energy, of course, is very is getting cheap, much much cheaper to build, but it still costs something, right? Sure. Yeah. And social, uh, social on the social end, of course, there's people who live nearby to the facilities, but also you know there's the sort of broader cultural elements of mm -hmm. uh, building renewables. And so uh, you're using up resources uh, like both physical and like <laughs> mental um, and social in the process of this, right? Uh, and what that means is that you really have to make smart choices about what those renewables power, right? Mm -hmm. um, should they power a school or should they power a Bitcoin mine, right? Like, uh, should they displace <laughs> fossil fuels or should they um, fill rising demand? Um, and so um, maybe just to give an a good example of this, back in Australia, uh, when I started in the industry in 2010, in the renewable energy industry, there's a really funny way of thinking about renewables, which is that, like, you know, the reason that Kevin Rudd, the a former uh, sort of centre-left um, Prime Minister of Australia, got this really aggressive renewable energy target passed through Parliament is he sort of made a deal with fossil fuel companies and he said, look, hmm. I know that all of you guys own coal pl power plants and coal gas plants and you don't want to be generating less power. So what's going to happen all of our forecasts show that demand, electricity demand, is going to keep rising and rising and rising into the future. So renewables will just kind of fill that that rising, like the, mm. the rising demand. Um, and the reason that they were making that forecast of rapidly rising demand was air conditioning. Um, <laughs> they basically thought that people would go nuts with air conditioners, right? And they just thought, oh, great, you know, so many people are going to buy air conditioners. The whole power <laughs> grid is going to be like, you know, consuming so much power and we need to fill that power with clean sources. Unfortunately, what happened is about two years two years later, suddenly everyone realized like, oh crap, demand isn't rising at all. Um, it actually kind okay. of leveled off, right? Because uh -huh. you know people became a bit more conscious with their energy energy consumption. Uh, um, you know, the size of houses stopped increasing, um, uh -huh. and uh, you know, um, energy, uh, uh, there was a lot more um, focus on um, insulation and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And all the fossil fuel companies freaked out. They were like, oh crap, now now renewables are going to start you know, pushing downwards into our share of, of power oh. generation. And they, and they absolutely lost it. And they were like, no, 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 we've got to cut the renewable energy target now. How dare you? Which actually ended up being cut in 2015. Wow. Right. So, so what this means is that uh, it, when you make demand increase faster, you are not necessarily fixing the problem of pushing down on the fossil fuel um uh, on the, on the uh, presence of fossil fuels in the grid, right? I see. Um, you you need to do two things to make emissions go down in the grid. Uh, you need to build renewable energy, and you need to make fossil fuels stop generating as much as they did yesterday. Uh, and if you're only doing one of those two things, uh, then you know, uh, like it's it's a bit of a problem, right? Yeah, because it's only um, additive in that sense, right? Because it's just yeah, it's new demand. I see. Exactly. So if you made fossil fuels generate less, yes, you would be reducing emissions, but you would also be introducing um, grid scarcity problems, of course, because you're not yeah. building new things to replace that power. Um, and so uh, basically this idea that you uh, you can build a new Bitcoin mine, but look, you know, we did a PPA with um, a solar plant or a wind farm. 
Um, and that that solar plant or wind farm wouldn't exist were it not for our the cash that we that we sort of gave to them through our deal to to power our Bitcoin mine. Uh, then you know, basically the next question is like, well, what if we had found a way to make those two things get built where they actually meet existing demand and push down on the presence of fossil fuels in the grid? As opposed it's to actually being reducing inert. emissions, yeah, yeah. So it, it's a very, it's a very sort of like uh, nothing thing to add new demand for you know that is like you know specifically designed as like a very sort of private, for profit, mm -hmm. um, individualistic thing, um, and then go, oh no, I was socially responsible because I because I didn't you know <laughs> pull power from the grid. I, I built this new solar plant or wind farm. Um, so so basically, um, it's not neutral it, sorry it's neutral in the purely in the grid emission sense it's actually destructive in the real physical sense because uh you are consuming all those resources that i mentioned that it takes to get renewable energy exactly. built. um and those resources are not infinite right like it like the fuel that you put into a solar plant or a wind farm are effectively infinite on our sort of lifespans and time scales mm -hmm. but um the materials um the the sort of like cultural cachet um, of, of renewable energy, uh, which of course, you know, every single year we see some new kind of like uh, cultural attack on it or sure. some new fight uh, about mm -hmm. the way it exists in grids. Um, so it's totally wrong uh, to it say. It makes total sense. Um, yeah. yeah. And you can also see it in um, the way the pandemic played out, of course, like a really dramatic reduction in electricity demand and then a really dramatic rise in electricity demand. And so for the first step, when, when demand fell, renewable energy actually increased its share because it's really, it, renewable energy performs really well when mm -hmm. demand is falling. But unfortunately, now that we're in the upswing where, you know, um, uh, people are moving around a lot more, um, industry starting back up again, people are sort of um, going back to offices to some degree, um, electrical consumption is increasing around the world. And uh, unfortunately, Fossil fuels have kind of regained that share. Um, yeah, uh, it's really, really, it's really concerning, really bad. That's a good but segue that, um, into into the next piece. Like, so I think that's really useful to understand because I didn't really have that understanding that you know more renewable sources isn't always a good thing if it's not helping push down the the actual fossil fuel emissions. Right? It's just you know kind of additive demand. Um, it, it would maybe be less egregious if Bitcoin miners were just doing the renewable stuff, but they've also been firing back up old fossil fuel power plants, as far as I'm aware. So that surely can't be good for the environment. I was wondering if you could just talk about that. I know that local residents, I think, in New York actually had to vote against that that actually going ahead. But Yeah, I think it's just a really stark example of what we're, what we're talking about here, which is uh, that there doesn't seem to be any real inherent guiding star for mm. uh, social responsibility uh, and environmental responsibility. Um, and uh, this type of behavior is really, really common. Uh, and it doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any sort of pushback from other Bitcoin mining companies when it happens, right? So even the ones that aren't doing this really, really, really bad thing they don't, they kind of just keep quiet about it, right? They're just like, oh, let's just not mention that. <laughs> um, and so, of course, uh, the fight to, there's two different fights that are happening in power grids at the moment when it comes to fossil fuels. One is a reduction in, in the energy output of fossil fuel plants, and the other one is the closure of the plants themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, they're two really different things. So, so, like, you can actually get a lot of reduction in emissions from power, from, like, coal plants that basically just go, go from generating a lot to generating very little. little. Mm -hmm. um, and so the UK is maybe a good example of this, where there's a lot of coal plants that just kind of just generate like a pittance. Um, okay. And they actually restarted one up as backup um, for the coming winter due to a whole bunch of energy scarcity issues. Mm. And I looked into it and I'm just not mad about it, you know, because it's mm. just like, yeah, it's probably not going to generate much at all. However... Closing them is the ultimate goal, right? Because, of course, you want them to not be able to generate. Right. Obviously, during this transition process, um, uh, 
it's we can kind of like swallow our pride a little bit and go, let's accept a, a reduction in, you know, if it stays open. But eventually they have to be closed. And when they close, it's a very, very, very tough fight usually, right? Like it's it's a, usually a, a real mess um, and a real battle to, to close uh, fossil fuel power stations. Yeah. Uh, and so to have a force that is now bringing them back to life after, like, if you can just imagine, like, the, the sort of cumulative collective, like, decades of life that that people dedicated the hours of their waiting <laughs> time to to closing them um, and then to have it just kind of undone by somebody who just kind of, like, steps in and goes... Yeah, you know, um, let's just this one looks fine. <laughs> let's yeah. just fire it back up and start, you know, and and, and so uh, that whole thing that we just talked about, like with stranded energy, yeah, um, you know, it's sort of the same. It, it's like they basically kind of just hunt down energy that is not particularly well guarded, um, and that is you know vulnerable to being um, co opted towards this purpose, right? Mm. Um, they kind of frame it as like they kind of frame themselves as like uh, like healthy parasites, you know, like, uh, <laughs> like you know, we're, we're good, you know, yes, we're parasitic, but we're kind of like hunting down and finding all the sort of waste and the off cuts and we're consuming them right. and cleaning everything up. But it's not really how they actually operate, right? They act, they, they operate like more like actual parasites, which is that they don't actually care that much what, what they latch onto, right? Mm. Um, all they care about is really getting as much energy as they possibly can. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's a really, it's a really horrible thing. Um, and of course the, we're seeing more and more of it, um, because, uh, they're very good at it. Um, they're very yeah. good at finding these sites and, and, and firing them back up. It's a terrible thing. It is. Yeah. It sounds terrible. And I, I guess, you know, to your point the, about them being kind of parasites, there isn't really an incentive, right, for them to not just go and try and find the cheapest, most readily available way to burn electricity to mine Bitcoin, right? No. So so often, you I've seen this defense a lot, which is basically like they'll kind of go, oh, well, you know, don't you people say that renewable energy is the cheapest power available? So, you know, we, we uh-huh. want the cheapest power. So wouldn't we just naturally be inclined to find renewable energy? So what that is actually referring to when we talk about renewables being cheap uh, is it's actually referring to build costs and operational costs, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, renewable energy is, is is very, very cheap to build. Um, and of course, increasingly, uh, it's getting much, much cheaper to operate to the extent that it's competing, you know, with, uh, in, in some cases in the world, it's cheaper to shut down your coal plant and build an entirely new uh, renewable energy facility, you know, <laughs> than like, leaving your leaving your coal plant running Mm -hmm. uh that is not the case everywhere uh it's actually a real patchwork so in some cases it's 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 much much cheaper to find some vulnerable like you know recently closed uh gas plant and buy it off whoever owns it for a pittance um because it's already there you don't need to build anything you don't need any construction crews any planning approvals blah 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 Mm -hmm. Um, no materials. It's all just there. You just need to buy some fuel, um, and then you, you're getting your you're getting your Bitcoin. Um, and so that whole argument about cost and cheapness uh, it really obscures this complicated reality, uh, yeah. which is that renewable energy is cheap where it matters, right? Which is decisions about you know companies and governments planning entirely new energy systems. But in the context of uh, a sort of somewhat parasitic industry that just basically is just energy hungry and is not like planning a grand transition, but rather kind of is just hunting for like vulnerable, cheap access to energy, um, then it's a very different scenario, right? Yeah. They're not really they're not really thinking about these other things. So not, yeah, yeah. No, that's not good. Okay, yeah, that's that's a good nuance to understand. Um, I recently spoke with. Polly Hemming, who I think you're familiar with, um, about carbon credits and offsetting. In addition to, to you know, just burning fossil fuels directly, um, is there? Have you observed any kind of uh, carbon offsetting at play in the in the world of Bitcoin mining? So I'm a I'm a I'm a big big fan uh, of Polly. Uh, I really I learn a lot from what she writes and um, mm-hmm. everything she does. Uh, and I have been focusing very much specifically on carbon offsetting. Uh, in the past year in my in my day job, in my work, uh, because it features very prominently in corporations who are 
kind of wanting to cheat their way through their climate targets. Uh, yeah. They'll kind of use it in two ways. Uh, one way is they'll use it in an immediate sense. So you'll have like, uh, you might go to fill up your car with petrol and there'll be a little sign on it saying, this is carbon neutral petrol. Or, um, <laughs> you know, like, there are a bunch of companies selling what they refer to as carbon neutral oil. Um, and literally all they're doing is they're purchasing um, they're purchasing carbon credits or offsets for, wow. for the equivalent amount of emissions that are associated either with digging up the oil or burning it when it's used. Yeah. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into too much into the detail of um, you know the problem with offsets because I think Polly explained it really well. Yeah, yeah. But I think that basically what they represent in the context of uh, of crypto money, and I see it a lot. Um, okay. It's really it's a very very uh, I, I, I do a lot of research into who is buying offsets, what they're being used for. Yeah. Uh, and it really, crypto uh, and Bitcoin specifically comes up a lot, right? Because Interesting. Uh, it's, yeah. And so it fits in with the deeper function of offsets, which is basically to protect destructive business models while also uh, trying to ease scrutiny on climate concerns, right? So uh, basically, uh, and I, I think I'm a little, uh, if you were to compare me and Polly on this, I think I'm probably a bit more um, fire and brimstone. Uh, I don't see any real, uh, I don't see any real um, uh, saving grace yeah. for, um, for offsets at all. Uh, I think that the, the damage that they've done is is far more significant than any help they've, they've done. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and crypto is actually a really good example of what I refer to as unavoided emissions, right? Which is basically, uh, so this is a concept uh, that Polly talked a bit about, uh, which is basically you buy a carbon credit and it's not like someone is then turning on a fan which sucks the equivalent of, of carbon from right, the air. Right. It's actually more like them saying, well, I planned to build a coal-fired power plant, but now that you paid me, I'm not going to, or I'm going to generate less, or mm -hmm. I'm not going to cut down the tree that I said I was going to cut down yesterday. <laughs> um, and this gets referred to as avoided emissions, right? Which is like basically like this alternative universe. You prevented something worse happening, therefore you get to do some bad action yourself. Yeah, uh, and it's and it's wild logic, right? Like we never we don't use this logic in any other part of human society at all, right? Like mm -hmm. you can't commit a crime and then say, no, 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 I paid someone else to not, not commit a crime. Therefore, <laughs> you can't put me in jail. For right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it's it's really, it's very, very frustrating. Um, it's freaky how, how widely this is accepted as normality, uh, even among people like me who are sort of pro-climate action. Mm. Uh, but what I have been seeing more and more is actually offsets being used to justify not taking action to reduce emissions. Gotcha. Uh, and okay. so um, uh, what when you kind of go back into the history of offsets, they were kind of presented as like this, like, look, you know, don't worry, don't worry too much about offsets. So right? they're only, they're only meant to be a last resort, right? Like sure. the, yeah. the, um, the example I always use is like the emergency helicopter, you know, um, that runs on fossil fuels. And it's like, you shouldn't really yell at like an ambulance helicopter for creating sure. missions because they're actually saving lives, you know, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. pretty useful yeah. thing. You may as well use your, um, if you had like good offsets, you know, that come from um, some permanent carbon removal, like a machine that you can actually account for it being removed. Save that for the helicopter, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Don't, don't just sort of throw them about for every single possible thing that you could be doing, right? Like, um, you know, you can go to websites and you can buy carbon offsets. There are hundreds and thousands of these websites, right? So I could kind of go outside right now. I could light a lump of coal on the ground and then buy an offset and feel like I've morally just, you know, neutralized what I've done. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, like, when it comes to crypto, uh the, they run on electricity, right? Yeah. Like this is um, in the scale, in like the sort of sequence of how we're solving high emissions things in society, electricity comes first. We have not solved it entirely. There's obviously still a long way to go, but we have done the absolute most out of everything, out of all the different sectors. Yeah. So when it comes to having an excuse for buying offsets because it was very hard to reduce your emissions... Yeah. Anyone consuming electricity does not fall into that category, right? You have options. You know, you, you have, have yeah. so many options. 
Um, and so, you know, some companies um, like Google, you know, they, they enter into um, power purchase agreements with um, renewable energy facilities, but then they also match the demand from their power centers to some degree, mm-hmm. um, not fully, but they match, they're, they're trying to do this more and more is like match the yeah. demand of their power centers to renewable energy output. Um, there's, there's just a huge amount of things that you can do if you're a high um, electricity consumer other than just buying some offsets, right? Yeah, you could because, just not not use a proof of, proof of work cryptocurrency. Yeah, you know? exactly, right? And so for all the reasons that that um, uh, that Polly outlined, yeah, um, it doesn't make sense to to use this really narrow niche, rare, and you know um, hard to get resource mm-hmm. of carbon removals. For stuff that is just the epitome of waste and excess, uh, like I mentioned, that ratio of just sheer volume of consumption to the tiny little devoid, you know, like <laughs> there's just this little skerrick of worth, um, which is just yeah. concentrated in so few people, um, uh, to then take that resource of offsets, which is already so badly misused and so uh, like used willy nilly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and potentially use it for this, uh, it's a really, really bad thing. So uh, it really, you know, uh, the vast, vast majority of offsets, so between 90 to 95% of the estimates I've seen aren't even removing carbon from the air, right? They're just right. convincing other people to, to, to emit less, right? And so um, basically you're not really offsetting anything, right? You're, you're, you're somewhat reducing the harm that you may have potentially caused had you not done the offset. Um, so, uh, yeah, basically they get used when a company or an industry wants to keep doing what it's doing, but they want people to stop yelling at them. About and realistically, it. we shouldn't waste the, the maybe very small slither of them that are actually removing carbon on proof of work cryptocurrency that needn't. Yeah. Really save exist. them for the helicopter. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we talked about a lot of these kind of pushbacks that I, I think a lot of crypto skeptics who talk even bring up the topic of climate are, are hit back with and pretty heavily like I've seen a lot of um, lobbyists that are kind of in the industry that push the Bitcoin is actually good they write white papers they write articles they try to influence politicians into believing this narrative um, I was wondering if you could just go into like who are these people that seem so passionate about pushing this narrative and how successful have they been in your eyes in in, in driving that uh, so in terms of who they are, um, they're, they're obviously somewhat invested in the value of uh, cryptocurrencies, right? Like that, yeah. that's kind of the, the basic assumption mm-hmm. uh, is that they, they, there's a reason that they put so much time and effort into convincing people that it's a sustainable um, and environmentally friendly way of getting money uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, they, they know that if there's a broad public backlash against it, the value of their own investments will re- reduce and they'll have sure. less money. Uh, it, it sounds cynical, but I think that's probably a pretty decent chunk <laughs> of what's going <laughs> on there. Um, and then um, th- there are other people who, uh, there's, I think there's kind of a small sliver of people who seem to have like a bit of a genuine interest. Um, and, and like, you know, I think like, uh, some people from the energy space have actually moved into crypto and Bitcoin mining, huh. um, and which is pretty interesting, right? Like they obviously yeah. come at it from a, they're very knowledgeable and they, they really come at it from, you know, the, their own background. Um, but often it then just turns out that they all, they too have investments <laughs> in crypto. I was going like, to say, how much of that is them just selling out? <laughs> yeah, basically, um, which is, which is disappointing. Um, but uh, th- that is sort of less interesting to me than um, how much I recognize the modern fossil fuel industry in, in what they're doing. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, you talked about um, the, like, the way that they prosecute this argument, which is like they create white papers, they're really aggressive on social media, um, they sort of, uh, they actually engage directly and I would argue pretty effectively with lawmakers um, decision makers, policy, like politicians, yeah. um, they engage with media, um, and they're, they're pretty good at it because, um, there's sort of a pre-existing body of, of disinformation when it comes to greenwashing and, mm-hmm. um, the fossil fuel industry, right? So mm-hmm. the fossil fuel industry recognized about a decade ago that, it, that it, 
the whole the whole process of just denying that the problem exists, it's not working anymore, right? Like they kind of <laughs> it's like, oh shit, you know, people actually believe believe the science on climate change, so we better we better actually change our tactics a bit, right? So uh, what they've done is they've shifted into a mode of what is described as delay, right? Mm-hmm. And so that is basically the act of convincing people that you're doing the right thing while not really bothering to do the right thing because you don't care about it, right? Yeah, yeah. So with the fossil fuel industry specifically, uh, they are, of course, uh, they can't exist without causing climate change, right? Yeah. So when I say that it's existential for them, it really is. Like they, they actually, they, they will stop ceasing existing as companies and corporations mm-hmm. um, and state governments, uh, you know, if they stop uh, either digging up or burning fossil fuels. Sure. So they freak out. Um, and so... Uh, they need to greenwash as a way of keeping themselves, um, their identities, like their actual, you know, keeping yeah. themselves going. Um, Bitcoin miners, I feel like uh, they sort of, they're like the fossil fuel industry in fast forward, right? Mm. Uh, so basically, they went through the initial denial of the problem. Mm-hmm. Now they're kind of entering into a phrase, into a, a phase of greenwashing. Um, and, you know, like there was a net zero a report, you know, for, for Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, they came out like a few months ago. Yeah, I read it, and like it's just like it's absolute trash that this misunderstands like all of the most basic concepts of this of this problem. Mm-hmm. Um, however, that's pretty interesting, right? Like because they they've now entered into the same phase, roughly, of where the fossil fuel industry is at, which is um, they need to very aggressively pretend to be doing the right thing. So when you look at the reports of companies like. Shell and Exxon um, mm-hmm. and like Total, uh, a bunch of other ones, uh, some big Australian ones do this a lot as well, like Santos and Woodside. Uh, they really focus very much on trying to pick an extremely narrow component of the damage that they're doing and saying, look, we're going to fix that <laughs> little tiny <laughs> yeah. silver. And so the, a good analog um, it, with Bitcoin mining is uh, obviously they consume a lot of electrical power and it's additional to what's already there on a grid. So they're kind of like lumping this huge big chunk of extra consumption on the grid. But then they say, when at times of extreme grid stress, we will happily reduce our power consumption by a small amount <laughs> um, <laughs> and o- on the assumption that you pay us for doing so. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, okay. Yeah. And so what what that is, is a very small fraction of the damage that they do. They're saying, look at us, we're dealing with what you're complaining about, which is our power consumption. Um, when in reality, uh, the damage that they cause is actually for the 99.9% of other times that they're consuming power on the grid. Um, and just to be specific about that, when you increase demand on an electricity grid, um, a lot of, uh, pretty much most markets in the world have this thing where you kind of uh, fill in demand, let's just say demand is about 100 megawatts for this specific interval. You want to fill that up, that level of demand, mm-hmm. with starting from the cheapest and then building your way back up, right? Yeah. So when you put renewables onto a grid, that's why it gets cheaper is because you're kind of having like at the bottom of the stack, a bunch of renewables and then when the stack finally hits the level of demand, whoever is in that final slot sets the price. I see. So let's yeah. just say uh, let's just say a hydro plant is there and they're offering it at fifty dollars a megawatt hour. That interval ends up being fifty dollars a megawatt hour. Sure. Chuck your Bitcoin mine on top of that, another two hundred megawatts. Let's just say, um, and then suddenly the grid operator is like, oh shit, okay, we need to fill up. We need to sort of uh, add in a few more generators and go up the bid stack a little bit more. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're hitting gas generators that are offering their their power at fourteen thousand dollars a megawatt hour because. <laughs> no, those gas generators don't want to generate unless there's they're like peakers, right? Like they, right, which yeah, means yeah. they only generate at times of extreme high demand. And so suddenly the price gets set to fourteen thousand dollars for that. <laughs> it's not a linear thing, right? It's not like an extra megawatt results in an extra twenty cents of, mm-hmm. of cost, right? You suddenly, as you start getting into these high levels of demand, um, suddenly costs start increasing very, very significantly. Those aren't moments when demand when a grid operator is saying. Hey, Bitcoin miner, turn down your demand because we've got grid stress. That's just kind of the normal market operating as it does, with yeah. like high-ish demand. That's where the damage is being done yeah. um, when you start having huge volumes of new demand for Bitcoin mining. 
So Interesting. it's exactly like the fossil fuel industry in that they'll kind of pick like a little tiny sliver and go, stop yelling at us. We're dealing with it. <laughs> you know, look but it at helps this demand them, response. It, it helps them doing. greenwash, right? Like it helps them. They use that tiny slither to then say, but look, we're, we're doing great work. Yeah. Yeah. And the other example is um, uh, where they, they go to um, gas extraction sites and uh, sometimes uh, gas is just, you know, a company will just be like, whatever, you know, when they when they extract oil or gas from the ground or coal, um, mm-hmm. often a whole bunch of methane will just float up into the atmosphere, sure. yeah. uh, which is awful because it's a greenhouse gas and particularly potent greenhouse gas. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, what some companies will do is be like, no, 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 we're going to flare it, right? So they, they literally set it on fire um, and by flaring it, you turn it into carbon dioxide, which is still a greenhouse gas, but not quite as potent as just letting the methane float up into the sky. Hmm. Bitcoin miners came along uh, and said, no, 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 don't, don't flare it. Um, actually, what we'll do is we'll capture that gas. We'll put it into our little portable generator uh, and we'll power Bitcoin mining um, using this <laughs> gas that would have otherwise been either released into the sky or burned. Um, and it's like such a tiny, like the most optimistic possible interpretation that you can have of that is that Combustion inside a you know contained generator is, is slightly more efficient and slightly yeah. less carbon dioxide sure, than sure, if sure. you were to just flare it, um, you know, light it on fire. But it's completely ridiculous to say that that's an environmental thing because in the end you are still burning a fossil fuel and adding greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Their argument is like, no, 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 we're doing it. It's like less bad than it would have been had we not done this. And it's like, well, first of all, they're providing a revenue stream to oil and gas companies, <laughs> but they actually specifically say, and I, you know, this is this whole issue is what inspired me to write that blog post last year because mm-hmm. there was a big thread about it, and I was like, this doesn't seem to get the whole point about greenhouse gases causing climate change. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and uh, you know, of course, um, when it comes to methane, you know, basically being. Um, you know, part and parcel of digging fossil fuels out of the ground. Uh, the the key thing is that you just need to not do that, right? Like, <laughs> uh, you need to. Um, so you either need to cap those um, yeah. those sites of leakage, um, or you need to significantly reduce the extraction of fossil fuels. Um, ideally, you need to do both. But taking turning turning the waste climate impacts of a fossil fuel extraction site into a revenue stream for fossil fuel companies. Is not a good thing. I think you but know yeah, if I had to if I had to posture a guess, I'd imagine that even though it's such a tiny slither, it's probably being successful because it's a good story, right? It sounds yeah. good. like they're going around, they're just that they're, they're capturing all this stuff that's coming out of you know gas pockets that already were going to be tapped. That's that's a good thing. It, it sounds good, I think, but I don't think a lot of people scratch at the surface and get to what's actually <laughs> happening. This happens a lot. It's not the only industry where. A waste stream is kind of being used as a primary mode of greenwashing, right? So um, the plastics industry is a really good example Hmm. where, of course, you know, human society overuses plastics, right? Like we've kind of been, when you trace back the history, um, a lot of fossil fuel companies were actually involved in this where they were like, yeah, you know, how do we get people to be ridiculously wasteful? You know, there was a guy... Um, this plastics guy, um, American dude, who was saying, you know, back in the 70s or 80s, I want to see bins like overflowing with discarded plastic. That's my dream, you know, because I want people (laughs) to be consuming so much plastic. Wow. Uh, And so single-use plastic, of course, is like the primary thing of like, this is why plastic is such a problem on earth. Uh, And of course, you get people who are like, no worries. What we'll do is we'll build a power station where you kind of just put the plastic in there and you burn it. Um, And then, you know, it's kind of like a weird fossil fuel, you know, (laughs) like that's uh, terrifying. full of carbon. Uh, It's very, very bad because of course it's so emissions intensive, intensive. Um, There's a lot of impurities um, in like all these different types of plastic. Um, All of it labeled recyclable, but fundamentally unrecyclable because you can't like, it's not being sorted correctly or you can't, the, 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 processes to recover the, the reusable parts are really energy intensive you've you've given um, me the one... uh idea for for another episode i think uh at some <laughs> yeah, point. But we, we do have to move on because uh we're, we're running short on time um 
yeah, that's I, I need to find some, uh, a specialist in plastics and plastic screen washing. But um, uh, just to cap this off, like, what is the grift here? Um, who who stands to benefit from this, and and, and who stands to lose? The the grift is, uh, I think, an increasingly effective way of presenting an extremely harmful activity as if it's beneficial. Uh, and that centers around a lot of public misunderstanding or I guess a lack of knowledge about energy and climate, um, all of which uh, I think is very understandable. I think it, it's not like I don't sort of blame people for not really getting a lot of this stuff. It's They're very uh, hard to access and co- comprehensible topics, mm-hmm. but it makes the grift very, very effective. And yeah. the effect, of course, is preserving the value of investments uh, that a lot of these people have made uh, on the assumption that they need to get more people coming into the system, right? Like they, like it's not enough to, for them to kind of just have the money sitting there. They actually need someone to look at Bitcoin mining and go, oh, that's great. That seems full of nice people and it's very environmentally yeah. friendly and maybe I want mm-hmm. to buy some too. Uh, the, so they basically have to churn through more and more people as time goes on. Uh, and that means having a good social recognition, right? Like having a sort of good uh, social understanding of what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Um, Hence the white papers and the reports and the sort of like leaky, weird arguments that that are just insisted purely through repetition. Uh, All of it is dedicated to uh, them having to maintain growth. And again, it reminds me so much of fossil fuel companies pleading with people to demand more energy (laughs) that's interesting to see yeah yeah. it's like an interesting analogy that that in many ways crypto companies have now come to resemble like these fossil fuel companies but fast forwarded as you said that's um i i try to focus on on hopefully there's optimism but uh if there's not just let me know but what is the trajectory on all of this so bitcoin seems resolute on staying on proof of work ethereum says they're moving to proof of stake, which will apparently solve all of these issues. Um, do you think there's hope here or is, is it going to get worse? I think, it, I think it really all comes back to the sheer scale of energy consumption. So if they reduce the amount of energy consumption, then yeah, I think so. Um, but it's actually a really interesting thing that you mentioned, the move from proof of work to proof of stake. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, you know, hitting a bit of a wall in terms of my knowledge and experience because I'm not like right down on the details sure, of, yeah. uh, like those two systems. But what I do know is when a culture uh, is exists in an industry that makes them weirdly resistant to change, even when that change is obviously beneficial. Uh, and so um, one clear example that comes to mind is back in the sort of 70s and 80s, um, a whole bunch of power plants and a whole bunch of like oil and gas extraction companies were kind of, it's not really there. It's more like the early nineties. They were sort mm-hmm. of like, here's starting to hear about climate change. They, of course they had their own internal things being like, ah, this is actually a real problem and we need to deal with it. Sure. And so they were like, okay, great. Well, maybe there's a way we can capture the carbon, you know, uh, let's call it carbon ah. capture and storage <laughs> or CCS. Yeah. Uh, and what they did was they go, they went, okay, let's kind of use this as a bit of a marketing thing, but let's not really put that much cash into making it a real thing because they didn't really want it to work that well, right? Like they didn't want to be burdened with the actual costs of dealing with all that stuff. Um, uh-huh. So CCS has kind of just existed as this thing that's just kind of there for nearly four decades now, and it just hasn't really grown or accelerated or come to capture any meaningful amount of carbon um, and it just reminds me of that same dynamic, uh, mm-hmm. which is like people talk about it constantly. Um, <laughs> but there is a reason there is like cultural friction, um, it, like in that society of people who work in that industry, yeah. uh, stopping it from happening. Um, that makes total and sense. So, and Ethereum have been yeah. talking about proof of stake for something like multiple years at this point, and it keeps getting pushed out and pushed out. So I think. That's an interesting analogy. Is proof of stake just the the same as CCS? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> interesting. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on. This has been really enlightening. Uh, where can uh, people follow you and follow your work? Uh, so my Twitter account is at Katanjay Zero. Uh, being on um, parental leave 
for a few months. <laughs> I'm not really going to be doing a whole lot of writing. So uh, Twitter is absolutely the best place to get in touch with me. Excellent. Okay, good. Well, thank you again for coming on. This has been a great episode. Thank you. Thanks.